Hello, everybody. My name is Frank Griesamer. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, as Christoph already said, I spoke about a, a relatively obscure topic in Portland as well, about box drawing characters. And this is, in a way, very similar. I don't always work with those things, but for some reason, for TypeCon, it seems to work out. So I'm going to talk about the Hershey fonts. And before you ask me what the Hershey fonts are, I want to tell you about how I discovered them. <clears throat> we need to go back in time for that. We need to go back to 2014. And uh, as you all do, I buy fonts. And one of the fonts I bought in 2014 was Minotaur by Production Type. I like Minotaur immediately for its style. It looks very idiosyncratic. I liked that it includes a full set of Lombardic capitals, which not every font has. And I also liked that it's drawn entirely from straight lines, which I thought was quaint and interesting. So uh, maybe you've heard about this website. It's called Typographica. Uh, one of the nicest things on Typographica is the yearly review of good typefaces. And for me, it was clear that I would review Minotaur. And I really didn't know much about Minotaur. I didn't know much about the design. I didn't know much about where it actually came from. I thought it was just an idea of the designer Jean-Baptiste Levé. But when I did my research, I went into probably the deepest rabbit hole of research I've ever been in. Um, and I started my research in the type specimen, of course. And apart from some type specimen typical fluff, there is this sentence that references AV Hershey series for early vector-based computing. And that sounds very interesting to me. I was wondering, early vector-based computing, what is that? Are there people in, uh, working on room-sized computers on very old systems? I was thinking of like Cold War scenarios and blast-proof shelters. And what I found out is that Hershey was a, a mathematical physicist and he was working for the Navy at the Naval Weapons Laboratory in Virginia, which had the world's most advanced computers at that time. So here you see the world's most advanced computer. Uh, in fact, this was exactly the image I was envisioning and this was the computer that Hershey was working on. Here you see an operator, probably not Hershey, uh, checking her Facebook status or something. <laughs> uh, this computer is called NORC. And here you see a couple of people working on NORC. I wish computers today had those labels. It's pretty cool. Uh, there are no photos existent of Hershey, so I like to imagine he's one of them here, maybe him. So what were people doing on this NORC? Of course, they were doing high-performance computing, but what was the most important thing about this NORC machine was the ultra-high-speed optical printer. The printer in those days looked like this. It's a General Dynamics SC4020. General Dynamics is known not only for making printers, but they also make like fighter jets and war machinery and stuff like that. Uh, this was really the heart of the computer, and in order to make you understand what the printer did, I want to show you a little video. This is like three minutes long. For recording information from digital computers, General Dynamics Evectron uses a device called the Charactron Shaped Beam 2. It uses Evectron in a manner different from other cathode ray tools. In the Charactron tool, electrons from the cathode are focused into a beam accelerated by a tubular element called an electron gun. The beam is aimed by selection plate at a particular spot on the tube matrix. The matrix of the tube is a stencil with tiny alphanumeric and symbolic characters photo etched through its surface. The electron beam is extruded through a particular character aperture in this matrix, taking on the shape of that character. A second accelerator in the tube neck speeds up the extruded beam. The deflection yoke aims the beam at its selected place on the tube face. When the electron beam hits the phosphor on the back of the tube face, it produces visible light. This light has the shape of the selected matrix character. The character is reproduced precisely 
and brightly. Beam shaping eliminates the complex circuitry, the waste of time, the non-uniform illumination found in other character-generating methods. Characters and symbols available in the Charactron-shaped beam tube can be much more complex than those generated by other methods. A leading research laboratory uses the SC-4020 to draw pictures. A space vehicle scheduled to orbit the far side of the moon carries a TV scanner with a 200-line scan. Signals from the vehicle are computer processed on the ground, and an input tape for the SC-4020 is prepared. The digitized picture of the moon's surface is recorded by overlaying the Charactron tube face with plot dust. Satellite orbits are drawn from the ephemeris information. These drawings in spherical coordinates can be prepared rapidly with updated tracking information. These, then, are a few of the applications of the SC-4020. Curve plotting, printing, tool path plotting, perk chart, mapping, and many other results of calculation. No other proven computer output device matches this versatility and speed. The effective uses of the SC-4020 are limited only by the ingenuity of the user. In the SC-4020, man has a device to make marks with speeds never possible before. This device has all the versatility of man's own hand. It lets man make his mark with unprecedented creativity. The SC-4020 is a product of General Dynamics Electronics. So, <laughs> so, so this printer um, was really a breakthrough. Uh, I found this sheet, uh, this leaflet of advertisement on some kind of uh, like eBay-like website, a very terrible resolution. But I copied the text, and it explains clearly what such an old computer meant. I'm not going to read all this text, but I'm just going to emphasize a few things. The computer printer generated only row after row of numbers and symbols. And I think two years ago, Jeff Kellum had a presentation about this at TypeCon. Uh, a big printer would print uh, numbers and symbols uh, like a typewriter, basically, mechanically. An army of draftsmen and clerks converted the figures into charts, graphs, and drawings. So those numbers needed to be converted manually into something readable and understandable. Transforming numbers into picture form that everybody can understand and use, that is the job of the SC4020 printer. And when I say printer, it is not like a laser jet of these days. It, it makes prints on microfilm or paper and up to a speed to up to 15,000 vectors per second. A vector is like a straight line. So this microfilm printer does work of 25 men at half the cost. Those guys here are laid off, of course, but it's all for, <laughs> they are bummed, but it's all for the sake of progress, so that's good, I guess. And the SC4020 really was a milestone. It made computer-generated graphics possible for the very first time. It created stuff like this for chemical formulas. It created very complex diagrams. I don't even know what that's supposed to be. Maybe a flow diagram. And of course, it was also used for fun. This seems to be from the exact laboratory that Hershey worked in. And Hershey probably thought, well, if, if, this, if this printer can produce all those diagrams very quickly, it can certainly produce a diagram like this or it can produce a more complex diagram like this in a bit longer time. And then it can also produce a diagram like this here. And finally, a diagram like that here. And as you might have noticed, those are all capital X's. So Hershey basically uh, hacked the diagram generating functions of, those, of this printer to print letters. He wrote a paper called Calligraphy for Computers that came out in 1969, and in this paper, he described the designs of various characters, and Hershey was very prolific in designing characters. He designed here a Latin alphabet and Greek, because he was a mathematician, it was kind of understandable, but he also created like a very beautiful script, 
he created cartel graphic symbols. I, I love that tree here. I think it's still, those still all exist as emoji today, I think. And he would also create real typographical solutions, like he created letters with contrast, he created ligatures, he created like uh, signs for alchemy and zodiac signs. He created variants of typefaces, black letter, and he created uh, Japanese uh, characters as well. And he also created optical sizes. The optical sizes are not called uh, as today's subhead uh, and uh, texts, but they're called Fortran, which was for the small Fortran formulas, cartographic, which was for use in maps, indexical and principal was for use in documents, and triplex was probably like a, a display use. There are styles which are uh, different by the number of parallel lines they use. The simplex line is a, basically a monolinear simple line. Duplex uses two parallel lines in both horizontal and vertical direction. Complex is basically like a modern face with uh, straight contrast and triplex is the most decorated of the four. So Hershey fonts are basically collections of characters which are composed of line segments. Uh, there are 14 styles of Hershey fonts, around 1,500 Western characters and 800 Japanese characters. So he was very prolific in creating those. Um, and it is noticeable that for those early computer fonts, the fonts are relatively good. And I think he was so good because he really used stuff that was good to begin with. He used like old uh, references, for instance, specimen books. He talked to calligraphers and he used the Leroy lettering set for the simplex styles. This is the Leroy lettering set. You could use the stencil here to create letters and then those are well known from comic books. And I would like to ask, is Alan Hersey the world's first digital type designer? I don't know, but it might very well be possible. What is definitely a fact is that Hershey facilitated what is now called as desktop publishing. He, uh, without him, stuff like this wouldn't have been possible, like annotating a graph, mathematical formulas printed on paper, or just normal typesetting. This was something totally novel in the time that you could print out something like this from a computer. And here's again a rundown of the styles that he created Simplex, duplex, and complex. For Hershey, complex script has a different meaning than it does today for type designers, but I think that's uh, pretty fun. So what's the status of Hershey fonts today? Um, they are in the public domain for quite a while, and uh, when you research Hershey fonts, you usually land in very nerdy computer geek forums. They are stored in an off-putting data structure, and they're usually not outline fonts. So this is what you find when you look for Hershey fonts. This is how they are stored. Uh, those, are, those lines are characters. And uh, when I first saw this, I was like, what the, what is this? I don't understand anything. <laughs> but it's actually quite simple to understand if you know how to divide the characters. So you know that the first couple of, of uh, numbers just denote the character index and the number of movements within that character. Space R always means, means the start of a new segment. Numbers are, for whatever reason, always calculated as offsets from the index of letter R. Every letter in the alphabet has an index. The index of R is 82. So if MTWT is given, it comes out to coordinates 5, minus 2, minus 5, minus 2. I think this just stores, uh, this just saves data storage. So to uh, bring this character, to make it a bit clearer, the character code is 501, the number of commands within that character are nine, the side bearings are defined, and three segments. And what we end up with is a capital letter A made out of three individual lines, where the yellow lines are zero. And there are many computer uh, programs, and that's what I mean with nerdy uh, stuff, that are just concerned with solving that problem. That's the, that is the result of their uh, work. And I'm not really satisfied with that because it's, 
it's no real no real fonts. There is no Unicode in the fonts, and it, it, there is no therefore no fun. Some are PostScript fonts, but they have re really uh, bad encoding. So I wrote a small script that would create uh, UFOs from the Hershey font file. So this is a screenshot from Robofont, where I have like the R for Hershey triplex Roman. And I didn't only do this for one character, but for all Hershey characters. So you can see here, those are all fonts. And those fonts are quite kind of special because they are zero width, just outlined in InDesign. This is the continuation of those fonts. You see the musical symbols here. And you see Cyrillic here as well. And you see black letter. And here you see the Lombardic caps. And there, for the first time, I understood that Jean-Baptiste included those Lombardic caps as a, as a nod to Hershey, which I think is very nice. It's not just a hipster decision. It's re as really is, uh, founded in history. And what Hershey also did, which is a crazy endeavor for the time, he encoded Japanese uh, glyphs, a portion of kana, hiragana, and katakana. And what I did with all this data, I made real OTF fonts. I assigned Unicode to all of them, including the Japanese glyphs, and therefore I can have made, made this presentation have lots of fun. Uh, The font files are quite special. This here are the font files that you can see in the finder, and you see there is nothing there because the outlines are zero width. Um, the, the Cyrillic ones and Greek ones, they don't show anything because they don't start with A. I think they could be folded together, so this project is still ongoing. Uh, what I still have to do is, I want to create like a filled in version, not just a zero width version, and I need to solve some math for that. I want to automatically write some variants there's a typo, with different outline thicknesses, and I want to release that whole stuff on GitHub, and it is going to be at the, in the Adobe Fonts GitHub repository, hopefully very soon. And if we look back at Minotaur, uh, and compare it with Hershey triplex here, we uh, pump up the line uh, a little bit, we can see it's really very similar but it's also a departure. Of course, the terrible spacing has been fixed, and Minotaur goes out to different weights that Hershey doesn't have, to different styles, and to totally different uh, ideas based on the original concept. And I think it's nice to see that such a uh, late historical idea can lead to something entirely new. I, uh, we bought beer here in Denver, and this, I found this in the fridge. I didn't buy this on purpose, but I noticed that this T here is all jaggy. Um, and it looks suspiciously like this uh, Hershey black letter font. I have really no clue where it comes from. So maybe somebody knows who designed that label. It's really curious. And I want to dedicate this presentation to Alan Vincent Hershey you can find barely anything about him on the web. His Wikipedia page barely exists. There are no photos of him. And it was really hard even to find his birth date and his when he died. But what I found is very probably his daughter, who is active on Flickr, and I think I will get in touch with her. Maybe I can get a photo of him and put it up on Wikipedia. And that is the end of my presentation. I want to thank you all very much. I want to thank Jean-Baptiste Levé for discovering Hershey and for making me aware of Hershey. I want to thank Ken Lundy and Dirk Meyer who helped me with finding Unicodes for Japanese characters. And I work for Adobe. Thank you very much.